1992 graduate and former professor of 19 years, our next speaker is no stranger to Boise Bible College. He also obtained a Master of Divinity from Cincinnati Bible Seminary and a doctorate from Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary. If you can't find him creating a new podcast for his Bible in Life online ministry, you'll find him hanging out with his wife Louise, taking care of his grandkids, or in a local coffee shop encouraging someone. As a preacher, teacher, and church planter of 30 years, he is well qualified to bring our next message from Ephesians 2 on the church, God's new temple. Please welcome John Whitaker. Here in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22, Paul draws out his first implication of the gospel, the salvation by grace that Sam just shared with us. And and in doing so, Paul speaks a word to us as God's people that even though this word is 2,000 years old, it speaks very clearly, very powerfully, and I think very profoundly to the church, not just today in general, but today in particular, at this point in time, with some of the stuff that we're facing right now. All right, and so chapter 2, 11 through 22, powerful word for us today. Junior high is... A, a tumultuous time for just about any kid. True? Um, and it was certainly true for me. Eighth grade year was particularly rough. I came home from school frequently uh, during eighth grade and cried uh, after coming home from school. And one particular moment stands out uh, really kind of like illustrative of why this was the case. It was lunch break at school. And I was in the gym, and I was sitting off by myself uh, on a bench or something in the gym, wallowing in self-pity about how bad things were and how bad my life was as an eighth grade boy. Uh, And the reason I was off by myself wallowing in self-pity was because um, I, I was too athletic for the nerds, I was too uncool for the athletes, I was a man without a place, didn't belong anywhere, completely rejected by all the kids. And so I sat there feeling sorry for myself at lunch break. And the moment uh, only got worse as one, one classmate walked by as I'm sitting by myself, looks over at me and says, you stink, and walks on. Um, and my eighth grade year was marked by that experience repeatedly. Uh, And I didn't know where I fit. And I think every single one of us has this desire hardwired deep within us to belong, don't we? We want to belong. We want to know where we fit. We want to belong to a group. Who's our people and where do we fit? We want that. And yet, and yet what we do is we use labels that build walls that drive us apart. True? True. Just listen to me sitting in the corner, wallowing in self-pity. Nerds, athletes, cool, uncool, where do I fit? Labels, right? And they probably had labels for me. And the fact is that does not change when we graduate from junior high or when we graduate from high school or when we graduate from college. It doesn't change when we're 25 or 30 or 50, right? We still want to belong, and we're still really good at using labels that build walls and drive us apart. And this text directly addresses that issue and thus speaks very powerfully to where we live. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Begins like this, Therefore, Remember, drawing this implication out of this gospel of grace, remember that previously you, the Gentiles in the flesh, pay attention to the labels, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision. Labels. Labels. They're the uncircumcision. We're the circumcision. They're those circumcised Jew. They're weird. Labels that build walls and drive us apart. And so you keep reading, right? You're called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision, which is performed in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you at that time were separate from Christ, excluded 
from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Notice that, labels, and then you get words like separated, excluded, strangers. Where do I fit? Where do I belong? Well, not with you, you're the circumcision. Not with you, you're the uncircumcision. And granted, in Israel's case, th there was some there was some actual intentional reasons for some separation. Driven by the uniqueness of Israel as a people, God's people under the old covenant, there was some reasons for that. And yet, what happened with time was as the labels got deeper and deeper into the heart, Israel, though unique, was called by God for the sake of the world. And Israel withdrew and withdrew and withdrew and put up their labels and built massive walls and looked down on the Gentiles and the Gentiles responded in kind and you get hostility and walls made out of labels. But now, verse 13, but now in Christ, the situation is different. Something has changed. But now, in Christ Jesus, you, you, Gentiles, you uncircumcised people, you who were previously far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. Notice that. And so often we, we use this line, he is our peace, meaning he makes me feel peaceful inside, which is true. Jesus does that. He provides peace, right? But that's not the point here. The point here is he is, notice, our, not my, our peace. He's the peace that's going to get rid of the labels. He's the peace that's going to remove the division and the walls. He's our peace who made both groups into one. He, he brought peace here, not just here, but here. He is our peace who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the hostility. He tore down the wall that divided us and kept us apart. And Paul, Paul's actually doing two things by that phrase, the barrier of the dividing wall. Paul's First and foremost, talking about the walls we build between us, the wall that stood relationally, formed out of labels and hostility between Jew and Gentile, that deep relational wall, that tension. He's talking about that, but he's doing so by alluding to a real wall, a physical wall. If you look at the temple in Jerusalem, we got this picture, you look at this temple in Jerusalem, here's a model of it. This is what the temple looked like, but if you zoom in a little closer, uh, that little, what looks like a dashed line, that was a little wall around the temple proper because Gentiles were allowed outside of that little dashed line wall, but inside, they weren't allowed to go in there into the temple proper where worship happened, where God was encountered, where scripture was re read, and prayers happened. They weren't allowed to go beyond that wall. In fact, if you go to the next picture, uh, we actually have ruins from that wall and inscribed on that wall in Greek, Latin and Hebrew, so everybody could read it, was the statement that, look, if you go beyond this wall, then you have yourself to blame for your death which follows. That's hostility. That's a wall of division. That's a dividing wall that has been erected between people that embodies the deep relational tension that Paul is talking about in Ephesians chapter two. And what did he say? What did Jesus do? Jesus broke down the barrier of the dividing wall, the walls that we build with our labels and our tension and our hostility, the walls that divided us before we came into Christ have been torn down in Jesus. 
Verse 15, by abolishing in his flesh the hostility, which is the law composed of commandments expressed in ordinances, all those rules and all those rituals that had served to keep Israel separate from the world, to make them distinct from the world, that had been twisted and corrupted over the course of their history into a wall that now caused them to look down on the world and label the world and divide from the world, all those laws have been fulfilled and taken care of in Jesus so that in himself he might make the two one new person one one new humanity so that all those things that they despised about each other could be removed and they're brought together into a new humanity there's Jew there's Gentile and there's those in Christ one new humanity one new person in this way establishing peace peace not just he makes me feel peaceful but relational peace peace between us peace in our relationships and verse 16 and that he might reconcile them both as one new humanity brought together in Christ now reconciled together as one body to God through the cross by it, catch the irony, by it, having put to death the hostility. You catch it? Here's the cross, an instrument of hostility, an instrument of torture, an instrument of death and state-sponsored terrorism, and God used it to kill the hostility between humanity so that he could form one new body and reconcile them. To God in Christ and so verse 17 he came and he preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near for through him we both have our access in one spirit to the father in 1992 my wife and I walked into a church in Richmond Virginia we walked into the 9 a.m. service and as we walked in we were the only white folk in church. We stood out like a vanilla chip in a bag of chocolate chips, right? And I will tell you this, I have never been welcomed so warmly as a guest in church before in my life. 30 years later, it's probably the warmest welcome still to this day that we have ever experienced as a visitor in church. People came from clear across the, the auditorium to greet us. One woman was up front, literally jumped over some chairs and ran up the aisle to give us a hug and welcome us. Warmest welcome I have ever received in church because Jesus tore down the hostility. He destroyed the wall. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we could take the welcome of a guest in church and extend it beyond that to saying, let's just remove the hostility and live together in peace. But look, up, look around at our world over the last 12 to 14 months. Peace? Do we see peace? I think we see hostility. There's been articles written in the last 12 months about the culture of outrage. Do we see outrage? Spend any time on Facebook? Twitter? Outrage. Hostility. Tension. Division. Um, there are real issues in our world, aren't there? And the issues matter. They matter deeply. And I'm concerned about those issues. But here's what makes me even more sad and more concerned. Is that the same hostility, the same fighting, the same tensions, and the same spirit of division has infiltrated the family of Jesus. And over the last 12 months, I have seen the exact same outrage within the church and between Christians that exists in the world. And yet Jesus died to kill that outrage. And he died to make peace. And we're fighting about 
masks or not masks, vaccines or not vaccines, right? We're fighting about racial issues. Here's the thing. Here's what we need to hear. Jesus says, in Christ, the situation has changed. If you are in Christ, your fundamental identity is not American. If you're in Christ, your fundamental identity is not American. It's not Republican. It's not Democrat. It's not conservative, liberal, progressive. If you're in Christ, your fundamental identity is Christ. Christ. That's your identity. And he shapes us, doesn't he? He shapes us. And what did he die for? He died not just so you could have a nice relationship with God. He died to make peace and kill the outrage. And if we tend to think of ourselves first and foremost as American, conservative, or whatever we think, if we tend to think of ourselves first as white or black or brown or progressive or whatever, whatever other label we do, if we, if we think of those things first, guess what we do in the family of Jesus? We replicate the tension and hostility and the walls of division that we see in the world. The very thing that Jesus died to eliminate. What if we said, in Christ comes first? In Christ comes first. What, what, what does it mean to be in Christ? And that doesn't mean the issues don't matter. It means we're going to figure out how in Christ to deal with the issues, just like they had to. Right? Acts chapter 15. How do Jews and Gentiles relate together? And they had a whole meeting of the apostles to try to figure that out. We're going to figure it out. How do we deal with these issues as a Christian in Christ so that there can be peace? Because Jesus, Jesus died to kill the hostility and to tear down the walls so we can live together in peace. And why does this matter so much? Well, this matters so much because of what Paul says at the end of chapter two. So then, you, we, us, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. It matters because we're, we're God's household. We're, we're the family of Jesus. And the family of Jesus is supposed to show the, the rest of the world, what does it look like when Jesus is in charge? When Jesus gets to do what he wants to do, what does it look like in Jesus' family? Does it look like just you know, posting the same sort of vitriol and hatred on social media? Does it look like replicating the same sort of tensions and hostilities that the world does? Or does it look any different in Jesus' family? It matters because we're Jesus' family. And we're supposed, to, we're supposed to be a new humanity that looks different. We're God's family, his household. And it's got to look different here if it's going to be attractive at all out there. Not only that, not only are we Jesus' family, but we're also God's temple. Look what he says. And having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building, a temple, being fitted together, is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling for God by his spirit. It matters because we're the temple of God. And a temple is a place where earth and heaven are supposed to interlock. A temple, it was a place where mankind is supposed to come and experience the truth, wisdom, and goodness of God. A temple is a place that's supposed to reflect the wisdom of God back into the world. But if the temple is acting just like the world, how could we ever be a city set on a hill? Right? It matters because God called us to be a new humanity who looks different. And that means we need to get on our knees with our Bible open before us and we need to figure out how can we do it differently like Jesus would. Jesus died to kill the hostility and outrage that's all around us. Jesus died to tear down the walls of tension and division that are all around us so that in him, as those in Christ, not as Americans, not as whatever else, as in Christ people, so that we could live together in peace. So, 
based on what Jesus did, based on the price that he paid, here's what I would say to us as God's people. What God in Christ has joined together, let no man tear apart. Thank you.